this uh, textbook here. I'm going to give more details about the textbooks later. So if you want to read uh, this after the, uh, the lecture, uh, please go ahead. But the bottom line is I will give all information in the lecture. Uh, so these are recommended reading if you want to know uh, more about the topic, uh, but attending the lecture uh, should be enough. Uh, for the course, uh, I will uh, use the Blackboard uh, to post all announcements, assignments, labs, tutorials, lecture notes, and everything. Uh, these are my office hours, uh, Tuesdays, 3 to 4 p.m., and by appointment, if you're busy during this time, through MS Teams. You can just send me a hello message and I'll get back to you uh, right away or I'll let you know how long you need to wait because I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm in a meeting with another student. Uh, the class will be on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 11.20 a.m on Blackboard, so you're here already, you know that. Uh, the labs and tutorials will be on Wednesdays uh, from 1 to 3.50 p.m., also on Blackboard. It will be a mix of uh, problem solving and uh, MATLAB uh, labs and simulations. I, uh, I hope that you have already checked the first lab, uh, Lab Zero is to introduce you to MATLAB and refresh your memories if you already know what MATLAB is. And it will be this week, so uh, we have a lab this week. Please start uh, working on uh, Lab Zero. Uh, the prerequisites for this course, uh, course are Math 2780, 2790, and Elec 3160. And I also uh, believe that you've already taken these courses before. Uh, for the grading, uh, the, the, the majority of the weight will be on the midterm and final exam, 30% on the midterm and 50% uh, on the final exam, and both will be uh, take home. And there will be 20% on assignments, participation, and quizzes. Uh, uh, participation here uh, will be uh, based on your interaction in the class, in the lectures, by either asking questions or answering questions. I'll be asking a lot of questions. So, uh, and of course you, uh, of course you can uh, get participation points by uh, by sharing some interesting topic with me after the lecture or posting some interesting topic in the discussion forum on the Blackboard uh, websites. All these will, will give you uh, extra points. Uh, for the quizzes, there will be uh, two quizzes. Uh, uh, within these, 20% uh, as well. Uh, no, attendance uh, will not count in participation. However, I highly recommend you uh, to uh, to attend the lectures and participate uh, and, uh, and ask questions. Uh, will you be providing us with a license to MATLAB? I have already posted uh, in, instructions on the Blackboard website how, how to access uh, MATLAB. Uh, please check uh, the Blackboard website uh, under uh, resources. Uh, yeah, under resources, uh, lab. Uh, and, and instructions to access uh, the server with MATLAB. Uh, any other questions uh, so far? Good. Uh, for the um, textbooks, I'll be mainly using uh, these two textbooks, but please do not feel that you have to get both. You can uh, you can get whatever uh, whatever one you like. Uh, I, I will uh, use the first one more, but as I said, I'll cover everything in the lecture. So if, if you do not really feel you have to purchase a book, that's, that's fine. Uh, you, uh, for this book, you can get the fifth edition or the fourth edition if, if it's cheaper. That's also uh, up to you. Uh, now some policies for the class. Uh, this is uh, 
not everything, uh, please feel free uh, to uh, to read the course syllabus document I have shared uh, the last week with you uh, on the website to uh, to know more about other policies that I expect everyone uh, to follow. Uh, would the LATI and Zing one be sufficient for those planning on taking digital communication in fourth year? Uh, I don't know who's teaching the, the class next year, but but if it is me, uh, so no, uh, I'm I'm using uh, I'm using other uh, books. Uh, so first thing, uh, please feel free to stop me if you have any question, or you can just send uh, send it over the chat box, and I'll answer it uh, right away. Uh, please also correct me if you think I said something wrong. Uh, we all make mistakes, so uh, do not be shy and just let me know if you if you feel something might be uh, wrong and we can discuss it to see uh, whether it is uh, correct or not. For the exams, uh, as I said, both midterm and final uh, exams will be uh, take home. Uh, you are not permitted to discuss the exam with anyone and students with similar answers will be asked for a follow-up oral exam uh, to make sure that you're uh, you're not just copying each other's answers. Uh, for the homeworks, I highly encourage groups and discussions with each other. However, I expect each student uh, to submit their own write-up. Uh, so you cannot just uh, submit the same write-up as, as your colleague. Uh, this will not be allowed. Again, please uh, read the course syllabus. Uh, documents I, I shared the last week with you for more details and uh, let me know if you have uh, other questions. I have also posted the office hours uh, for uh, your uh, TAs, uh, so please uh, feel free to contact them uh, during these times and uh, they will happily answer all your questions. Uh, this here is a tentative list of topics that we're going uh, to cover this semester in this course. Uh, topics may change, but will not change a lot. So, uh, first, I'm going to give some introduction on communication systems and, and modulation theory, and uh, review uh, some of the presentation uh, of signals and systems uh, you took in the signals and systems course. And I hope you. Uh, you remember these topics. Uh, the review will also include reviewing uh, the Fourier representation of, sig of signals, like the Fourier series and Fourier transform. Then I'm going to talk about signals, transmission, and, and filtering. Uh, for the majority of the class, we'll be covering some of the analog uh, modulation techniques, like the amplitude uh, modulation and the angle modulation, including uh, frequency modulation and phase modulation. And of course, if you're not familiar uh, with any of these terms, they will be clearer by uh, this week. Then I'm going to briefly uh, 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 give a lecture on random process and transmission over a linear system and how noise uh, affects analog uh, communication and finally we'll conclude with how we can sample analog signals which would be the introduction to the digital uh, modulation and digital signals so uh, any questions so far good again uh, please feel free to ask questions over the chat box if, if you want to know something uh, I have been saying communication systems, but, but what is a communication system? A communication system is simply a system to send information from a source that generates messages to one or more destination. So you have a source here, you have a destination here, and this source have some information and want to share it with this destination. So that's a communication system. Regular mail is a communication system. You have a letter, you want to send it to a destination. That's a communication system. These are some other uh, types of uh, communication systems that were at some point of time uh, extensively used 
and currently used. This is, for example, is the telegraph or the phone, a telephone network or the radio, TV, the computer networks or, or Wi-Fi networks, cellular networks. All these are example of communication systems. Any system that sends information from point A to point B or points B, C, and D is a communication uh, system. The communication system has some elements. This is a general uh, diagram for communication system. The, this, this diagram may vary from one book to another, but this, the idea here is the same. As I said, we have a source that has some information, and we have a destination that is intended to receive this information. So the source here uh, with, the, with the message that want to be transmitted could be a human voice, like when you talk over the phone, an email message, a text message, anything. This is what we call the input message. But this input message is not in an electric uh, waveform. So first we use an input transducer. And the purpose of this transducer here is to convert the input message into an electric wave form or what we call the input signal so this input signal here is electric signal some examples of the uh, input transducers are the microphone like when you talk in 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 the microphone or in your or on your mobile phone the microphone converts this voice into some electric signal the keyboard when you hit a key translates that this key to a sequence of 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 bits or pulses which is also an electric waveform or a camera these and there are other examples of course of input transducers once the signal is converted into electric signal it has to be transmitted, right? So this is uh, why we use a transmitter. This transmitter can do lots of things, but the basic function of the transmitter is to transform the input signal into a form for efficient transmission. And the key word here is efficient. And we're going to talk about what efficient means in this, uh, in this case. Some of the functions of the transmitter could include analog to digital uh, conversion so this is analog a over d means analog to digital conversion encoding modulation and other things and we're going to talk about what this means later but this is a process to convert or transform the input signal into some signal that is efficient to transmit so once we have the signal we need to transmit here we need some medium to transmit this signal and the medium here is called the channel so the channel is a physical medium to send the electric signals over a distance this medium or the channel can be a copper wire can be a coaxial cable can be an optical fiber can be a wireless link so uh, let me ask you this uh, for example in your home when you're using the internet what type of channel are you uh, currently using to connect to this lecture? Good. So that's actually great, not just good. Ethernet and wireless links, Wi-Fi. You're, you're, you're all right. Some, some of us are connected directly using the Ethernet cable. Some of us are, are using wireless links to connect uh, to the access point or or to the router which which are all correct some of us are even connected through some optical fiber so this is what channel means it's just the medium that takes your message and send it somewhere and it is the same message the same medium you use to get messages uh, as well so once the uh, transmitted signal goes through the channel it becomes distorted so this channel adds distortion and it adds noise and we're going to talk about this also uh, later because it's not perfect 
its imperfect channel. Then at the receiver, this uh, receives some form of signal. The receiver here does something really important. It recovers the message signal from the received signal and removes, or to be more accurate, tries to remove distortions and noise caused by the channel because you cannot really completely remove the distortions and noise in in most of the cases so the the, the purpose of the receiver here is to uh, to try to recover the transmitted transmitted message uh, from this uh, received signal and as you can see it just tries to reverse what the transmitter has done for example modulation if if there was modulation at the transmitter it performs demodulation at the receiver if there is encoding it tries to decode the signal if if there was some analog to digital conversion it tries to uh, convert from digital back to analog so the purpose of the receiver is actually reversing what the transmitter did to the signal and removing the distortions caused by the channel. Then we have our output signal, which is still an electric signal, like the input signal here. We want to convert this signal back to its original or other intended form. This is why we use the output uh, transducer, which is the uh, opposite of the input transducer. It's converts this electric signal or the output electric signal here into some other uh, form that we need at the destination. For example, it could be a speaker. It reverses what the microphone does. The microphone converts from the voice to electric. The speaker converts from electric to back to voice. Or it could be a display screen. You want to show your email. So it converts these electric message into letters and pages etc uh, or a printer to print the, the message uh, and then we get our output message to the uh, destination one uh, thing to note here that you do not really have to have the same form at the source and the destination maybe uh, we are sending a human voice here but we want to receive a text message. So this output transducer does not have to exactly reverse what the input transducer is doing. It's all based on uh, what the destination uh, needs and what the source intends uh, to send to the destination. Does a modem in, in our house perform all of this? That's a good question. Uh, can someone uh, let us know what modem means. Let me write it in capital letter here. Great. So actually, yes. So modem is 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 short for modulator, demodulator. So it does this this part here. Transmit it. It takes the electric message, does the modulation, transmitted over the channel because it is connected with an Ethernet, for example. And then, at the receiver, they have a similar modem. Or when you receive a message, uh, uh, the modem gets this message uh, from the channel and does the demodulation, decoding, etc., and feed it to your laptop, for example, which has the output. Uh, transducers. So yes, that's 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 a great point. Modem is uh, is a, a, a transmitter uh, plus uh, receiver. Yes, I will uh, I will share the slides uh, after the lecture, and I'll, I'll try uh, in 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 the next lectures uh, to uh, to post it before uh, before the lecture uh, in case you uh, want to take your notes. Uh, Okay, now let's talk a little bit about distortions and noise. Just for, for this first lecture, you'll feel, you'll feel that we're covering some random topics, but because these are uh, introductory stuff, uh, so we'll, we'll have to cover some really small topics, but we're going to talk later about each one of these topics uh, throughout. Uh, 
uh, this semester. So uh, we said that the channel introduces distortion and noise uh, to the signal. In, in reality, or uh, to model the channel, it behaves uh, like an imperfect filter. It attenuates the signal and distorts the signal. So this is one way to model the channel. We have a transmitted signal here. Let's call it S of T. The, what the channel does is it, it acts as a filter. It, this filter here, as we said, add distortion or distorts the signal, and it adds noise to the signal. So the received signal at the receiver is just the output of this distortion or, or this filter plus some noise. Does someone know what this symbol means? You should know what this symbol means. Good. That's correct. This is the convolution. So this is the output of, of this filter. Uh, it's, it's just the convolution of, of uh, the impulse response of the filter and the input plus the noise. So this is one, uh, one of the commonly used ways to, uh, to, model, uh, to model the received signal or to model the distortions and, uh, and noise. And again, don't worry about this, and we're going to talk into details about this in, uh, in a few weeks. This is one example of what distortion and noise means. Let's assume this is S of T, the transmitted signal. This is the signal. If, if you remember, we had the, uh, the channel, and the output from the transmitter was here would be S of T, and the output that goes to the receiver is R of T. So this is the, the, the signal we, uh, we want to transmit. It's a streams of ones and zeros in this case. It's a digital signal. And, and if you don't know what digital means, you'll know in a bit. So let's say minus A represents zero and plus A represents one. So this is just a stream of zeros and ones that we want to uh, transmit. But once this stream of ones and zeros uh, uh, goes uh, through the channel, you can see that it's it's not that perfect plus a or minus a anymore. It's just some attenuated uh, attenuated signal that's that doesn't even look digital any uh, anymore. This is here the output of this filter here. It is the signal. Uh, and the distortion. And then we add the noise, which makes it even worse. So this is here the received signal. This is what the uh, receiver gets. And as we said in the, uh, in the previous uh, two slides, the receiver is trying now to recover the transmitted signal from this signal here. So this is after some processing and trying to remove the distortion and noise, etc., this is what the recovered signal uh, would look like. And again, we'll give more details on the the specifics of the process and how the uh, the receiver uh, tries to recover the signal. Uh, is the received signal and recovered signal the same thing? Uh, yes and no. So, in a perfect world, the recovered signal should be S of T. But the problem is, as I said, you cannot remove all the distortion and the uh, the noise from the signal. So there is some form of error. And the error is simply the, uh, would be the recovered signal minus the transmitted signal. Ideally, we want this error to be zero, right? But in real life, it never is. There will always be some uh, some sort of error. And I'll give you some example here in, in the same figure. These two looks like the uh, looks similar, right? These two uh, figure, the S of T and the recovered signal look similar here, right? Does anyone notice any 
differences between S of T and the recovered signal. Correct. There is some shift here. If if we extend this line here, you'll notice that there is some shift. This is something that this receiver, for example, couldn't mitigate or couldn't traverse. So yes, or or a de or a delay. And this is again because of the channel. The the receiver was not able to idly extract the transmitted signal S of T from the received signal R of T. So there will always be some form of error between the recovered signal and the transmitted signal. And as engineers, uh, our goal is to try to minimize this error or satisfy some certain uh, requirements or, or constraints about these errors. Some, some systems can tolerate higher uh, errors which we can take into account but some others will really require uh, low errors and 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 for example high data rate so this it's 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 actually a trade off because it it is not easy to design such a system and and we're we're going to cover this but again to answer your question s of t and the recovered signal should be the same or this is what we try to do as as engineers when when we design a communication system but in reality they will not be the same there will always be some sort of error this error could be on on the uh, signal level could be a phase shift it could be a delay could be anything and what our goal is to actually minimize this error as close to zero as uh, possible Channel capacity. Uh, we mentioned we mentioned the channel, and we said that it distorts the noise, uh, distorts the signal, and add noise. But are there any other limitations on the channel? Yeah, the answer is yes. There are other limitations. First, let's 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 define two important uh, terms here: the signal bandwidth and the uh, channel bandwidth a signal bandwidth is the maximum range of the frequency content of the frequency components of this signal for example our voice signal our like speech our voice signal is let's say goes from like 50 to uh, 10 kilohertz for example what would be the bandwidth in this case so as we as I as I said again, the, the, the bandwidth is the maximum range of its of the signal's uh, frequency component. So for voice signal from 50 to 10 kilohertz, this means that the bandwidth is simply 10 kilo minus 50, which is again almost uh, 10 kilohertz. So this is how much frequency our like voice signal carries. What about the channel bandwidth? The channel bandwidth is the range of frequencies the channel can carry with reasonable fidelity. So channels regularly do not have unlimited uh, bandwidth. Their bandwidth is limited. For example, let's this is this was an example for uh, that signal bandwidth. And for for example here, the let's take like the telephone channel. Your landline phone the telephone telephone channel it can carry uh, signals from uh, 300 up to 3400 hertz which means that the bandwidth in this case is again 3400 minus 300 is just uh, 3100 Hertz. But what does this really mean that there is a signal bandwidth and there is a channel bandwidth? What is the relation between these two? As I said before, the channel is the medium that carries the signal. But if the channel has a limited bandwidth, in this case, in the telephone channel, it's from 300 Hertz up to 3400 Hertz or 
uh, kilohertz. But the signal's bandwidth is, or, or frequency component is from 50 to 10 kilohertz. What will happen if we try, if we try to transmit this voice signal over this telephone channel? Any uh, guess? That's correct. The channel bandwidth is the bottleneck. We cannot really transmit all of the frequency components of this channel. Uh, won't transmit. This is, yeah, this is not accurate. The, the accurate answer would be we cannot transmit the whole spectrum or the whole frequency component. What happens in reality is, is as Wissam said, you just, I assume you, you're, you meant truncated, you just remove other frequencies that you cannot transmit. So if, if let's say, if this is, uh, the frequency of the signal, and the signal is from 50 up to 10 kilohertz. But the channel can transmit from 300 up to 3.4 kilohertz, and this was let's let's write anything this was the, the the frequency or the shape of the signal what will happen is you'll just exclude these parts of the signal and you limit your transmission to the amount the band to, uh, the, the the channel can uh, can carry and you know what is the effect of this the effect of this and I, and I assume every one of you can notice it is that the uh, the quality of the, the voice over the telephone is completely different from the quality uh, over the internet, for example, or when you when you hear uh, when you hear someone talking, right? So the difference between the quality of the voice you hear in your phone versus when talking directly to someone is because the telephone channel removes the, the low frequencies below 300 and the high frequencies above 3.4 uh, kilohertz and this uh, this causes this uh, this effect uh, so the signal needs to fit within the channel uh, the signal bandwidth needs to fit within the channel bandwidth it, it's not fit it's it's more about designing you need to uh, limit the, the the frequencies you are going to send you have to do this choice. You cannot send the whole 10 kilohertz. Just uh, select this amount from this signal and transmit it. And what they end up uh, ended up doing is they just sent the uh, the voice signal uh, from 300 to 3.4 uh, 3.4 uh, kilohertz and ignored the rest of uh, the frequencies. And again, this is why the voice over the phone is different uh, from the actual voice of uh, of, of the person. Uh, why hold music sounds uh, so bad? Cannot transmit all of the frequencies of music over the phone. Ag again, this is this is the same reason. You can just try it. You can just randomly call someone and let let them play some music for you, and and you play it at the same time, and and see the difference. This is the difference. Because the the the, the telephone channel bandwidth is limited to these three point one kilohertz, they cannot carry all frequencies. They will have to remove some of the frequencies. This is exactly why the sound uh, sounds uh, different. Uh, so this is one uh, one primary resource in uh, any communication system. The channel bandwidth is not unlimited. It's going to strain, and you have to smartly or, or intelligently design your system to deal with this uh, limitation. For example, one desi design decision we just discussed is to limit the bandwidth of the transmitted signal to match the bandwidth of the channel in the case of uh, telephone networks. So the channel... Uh, Bandwidth, as we said here, limits the bandwidth of the signal that can successfully pass uh, through. There is another uh, primary resource in any communication system, which is the 
transmit power. The transmit power is is really important. And and let me give you really easy example to understand. Let's assume that you are standing like one kilometer away from someone and you're trying to talk to someone. You'll have to talk loudly, right? And by talking loudly, you're just actually increasing the transmit power. Because this transmit power, the higher the transmit power is, the, the, the longer the distance can travel. It can, uh, it, it, it can, uh, you can increase the dis this distance by increasing the power or reducing this distance by reducing the power. This is why the transmit power is really important in communication systems as well, because it determines uh, the, the coverage of, of, your, uh, of your communication system. One important metric that is related to uh, the transmit bar is the signal to noise ratio. It is, yeah, it, it, uh, or, or, uh, or SNR. It is simply the ratio of the signal power. The, the, by signal here, I mean the transmitted signal power. to the noise power. Uh, this noise is the one added at the channel. In any communication system, there is a minimum required SNR at the receiver. Otherwise, the receiver will not be able to recover the transmitted signal. So le let's, let's say, let's go uh, for this example uh, here for a second. This uh, signal here is noisy, right? But the receiver was able to recover some of uh, some of the transmitted signal because the, here, in this case, the SNR was higher than this minimum required uh, SNR threshold. But let's assume that the noise was like really high and the received signal was something like this. In this case, the noise is, is, is the noise power level is high and the SNR is too low. So the receiver will not be able to recover the signal. This is why the, it's, it's not just the transmit power, it's the transmit power relative to the noise power that needs to be above some uh, threshold in order to be able to recover the transmitted signal from the uh, received signal. So after defining all this, this is here, the most important performance metric in any communication system, which is the channel capacity. The channel capacity is simply the maximum achievable transmission data rate with some uh, arbitrary low error. And I'm sure that you've heard or read this before. Can anyone let me know what these uh, means mean right bit per second kilobit per second megabit per second gigabit per second these are how this is how we measure the channel capacity it's the maximum achievable transmission data rate and data rate we mean how many bits can you transmit per second and of course the higher the better the higher you can transmit data in, in, in a short amount of time is better. This is why, for example, uh, yes, this is why you are paying more in your internet subscription to get more bandwidth or more, uh, more channel capacity to your home because it is better. It costs a lot. It, so it's, 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 really, it's really important to understand the, uh, all these terms. First, you need to understand what error means in a communication system. As we said, the error is the difference between the recovered signal and the transmitted signal. And we'll try to keep this as low as possible. Uh, you need to understand what signal bandwidth means and what channel bandwidth means. And what is the relation between these two? As we said, the channel bandwidth is a limitation in the communication system. And you have to, uh, to limit the bandwidth of your signal uh, to uh, to successfully transmit over this channel. You'll have also to understand the effect of the transmit power 
on the uh, on the network and how is transmit power uh, power is related to the signal to noise uh, uh, ratio and how the channel capacity is calculated is what we're going to discuss here in this uh, slide so one of the most famous formulas to calculate the channel capacity is called the Shannon, the, I'm sorry, the Shannon formula or this uh, formula here. This formula simply uh, calculates the theoretical limit on the channel capacity or the upper limit on the channel capacity for a given uh, SNR level and uh, channel uh, bandwidth. So here uh, and this is for for something called the additive white gaussian noise this is for a specific types of channel which are, which are called the additive white gaussian noise channels and and don't worry we'll, we'll talk about this in in details later in this in this course but what what we want to know here, here is that the channel uh, is the channel capacity is related to the bandwidth the channel bandwidth and the snr or the signal to noise ratio with this formula it is b times log 2 1 plus p over n which is the snr and it is in bit per uh, per second so uh, let's give you a question. So first question, what is the capacity of a telephone voice channel that uses frequency, as we said, from 300 to 3.4 kilohertz and and signal to noise an SNR of 35 dB? Can someone quickly calculate this and let me know the answer? And the formula is here. This is the formula of the channel capacity. You do not have to pose the number. Just walk me through how you did it. Good, so first solve B. B is the bandwidth in this case. It's like we did it before. It's in this case, 3100 hertz. Good, now we have B. So SNR is P over N. Oh, I'm sorry, let me put a circle here. So this is SNR, I'm not pointing at N. Thank you for pointing this out. So let me address one of, one of uh, the messages here. P over N is 35. Now I made a huge mistake. Can someone point out what my mistake is? Correct. This is correct. That's a different unit. This DP here is different from the unit of this signal to noise ratio so signal to noise ratio is unitless or dimensionless because we're dividing power the signal power over the noise power so it should be dimensionless so we have to first convert from dp into a ratio so let me now correct this to convert from a dp a db to a ratio it's just 10 to the power 35 divided by 10. And once we have this, we can now calculate the channel capacity is 3100 log to 1 plus 
10 to the power 3.5. And if you do your calculation, it would be something like 36044 bit per second. Thanks everyone for, for participating in this one. So this is one lesson for you in the exams and, and in, in solving the assignments and problems. Double check on the units. Make sure that you are using the correct units. I, I, uh, I, I, I by the way, prepare to do this mistake intentionally. So do not feel bad that you confused the dB uh, with the ratio. I was about to write it anyway. So thank you for uh, for doing this. Uh, what can uh, the next question? What can you do as an engineer to increase the channel capacity? It's really, really important to understand this from the channel formula good one answer is to increase the bandwidth is there another way to increase the channel uh, capacity increase the snr but in, and instead of writing down increase the snr okay let me write increase the snr but wait what we can actually control is the transmit power not not the noise power. So in, in practical, we are increasing either the bandwidth or the transmit uh, power. So correct, we cannot decrease uh, the noise for a given channel. So this is what, as an engineer, uh, you, you'll have to design or you'll have to choose what is the application's bandwidth and what is the transmit power. You do not really need to increase both, right? You can just increase B to increase the, the, the channel capacity, or you can just increase uh, P, the bandwidth or the power. You do not have to increase both at the same uh, at the same time. And this is a really uh, a really important question. If if you end up a communication engineer, you'll have to deal with this a lot. Uh, uh, can the noise be controlled by quality of the cable, for example? That's correct. And this is exactly why I added for a given channel, you cannot decrease the noise. The only, or, 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 or as you said, if you want to really decrease the noise, you can just, or you, you not can, you have to change your channel. For example, if you're using a coaxial cable, you might just replace the coaxial cable with an optical fiber cable, for example. It has much less noise, and you can transmit with much higher capacity. But this decision costs money, right? It's expensive to replace the coaxial cables with uh, optical fibers or the Ethernet with an optical fiber. So again, cost is, is, is a thing here. And it is, by the way, the same issue with the bandwidth. Bandwidth is not cheap. Companies pay a lot of money to use a bandwidth, and they pay money to increase the transmit power because this is energy you're using you'll have to pay uh, for it and you pay money if you want to uh, replace or change your uh, your medium your channel or, or the quality of cable for example so all these are uh, are decisions you have to make as an engineer you have limited budget you have limited amount of money and you have to achieve these minimum requirements you have like minimum channel capacity you want to achieve you have to change uh, or or play around with the bandwidth with the transmit power with the type of channel that you're going to use to achieve these uh, these minimum requirement ideally we would have zero noise we would have unlimited bandwidth and we would have unlimited transmit power but this is not the case in reality and this is uh question three what is the data rate if there is no noise for example by no noise, n is zero. Correct, infinity. Because in this case, SNR would be p over n, which would be infinity, which will also mean that, that the channel capacity would be infinity as well. But this is not real life. This, this is not what happens in reality. The noise is never zero. There will always be, uh, be noise. And this is why it is important to understand the effect of noise on the channel capacity. When you, we increase the noise, we decrease the SNR, 
for the same P. And of course, we will have limited channel capacity as well. So this is why noise is, uh, is, is a really important thing that we need to take care of in communication systems. And again, uh, we have to understand how we can control B and P to mitigate the effect of, of the channel imperfections. Now, uh, let me also talk about analog and digital signals. We have, uh, I have used these two terms uh, without uh, defining them. Uh, so I assume that you already know what an analog and digital signal means, but le let's cover this uh, quickly as well. So an analog signal is a, a signal whose values vary over a continuous range, like this S of T on the left here. You can see that this is the value of S of T on, on the y-axis, right? And this is the time uh, axis. You can see that the value of S of T changes from, let's say, uh, minus A, uh, I'm sorry, from A, A, A min, let me uh, remove this minus sign here, from A min to A max. So you can see that S of T takes any value in the range from A min to A max. So this is why S of T in this case is an analog signal because the values vary over a continuous range. On the other hand, digital signals uh, takes val uh, values from a finite set of symbols. It is limited. For example, on the S of T on the right here, you can see that it is Let's say this is 2, this is 1, this is 0, this is minus 1, and this is here is minus 2. You can see that S of T is limited to the set minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. This is why the signal on the right is a digital signal. So as long as it is a finite set and you countable set, it's a digital signal. But if it is over continuous range, it is an analog signal. And these are some examples, and I'll, I'll, I'll need you to help me to uh, tell which one is analog and which one is digital. So for example, that if you're measuring the temperature, is this an analog or a digital signal? Analog, right. What about the pressure? Right, it's analog. What about the speech, voice signal? Correct, that's also an analog signal. What about a text document? Correct, that text documents are also digital signal. Why they are digital, uh, text documents are digital signals? Because they are a set of words or a set of letters, right? Alphabet is a set, so it cannot be out of these set anyways. This is why it is digital, and this is the same as musical note versus music itself. Is the musical note a digital or an analog signal? And the musical note is, is you know, these notes with, with the samples and, and things like that. It is a digital signal, right? But the music itself, when you perform this note, is an analog signal. So you'll have to understand these, uh, these concepts. They are really important. But but once you know the definition of analog signal and digital signals, they will be easy to tell apart. That, that as, I, as I said, the distinction is if the values vary over a continuous range, it's an analog signal. If they are limited to a finite set of symbols, it's a digital uh, signal. Good. Next, we talked about modulation. We talked about the need for a transmitter to change the signal and a receiver to reverse what is done at the transmitter. But why even bothering with this? Why is, is this important? Uh, sure, uh, please go ahead and, and, and type your question. I'll, I'll, I'll wait a second for you before starting this new topic.
or if you want, you can just use your mic and, and ask uh, and ask your question. Do not feel shy about this. Okay. Does analog always mean continuous time and digital always discrete uh, time? Or can you have discrete time, analog, and continuous time uh, digital? That's a great question. Uh, it's, it's jumping ahead. We're going to cover this in the next lecture. But that's, that's a great question. And I'll answer your question right now. So uh, what Justin is asking about is, let's say that our signal looked like this. Is this an analog or a digital signal? Be because it's not, uh, it's 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 not continuous in time. It it is zero here and it is zero here. Can someone tell me if this is an analog or a digital signal? It's an analog signal, right? Another question. Is this signal here an analog or a digital signal? It is a digital signal, right? Even though it is discrete in time, it is a digital signal. So being analog and digital is something, and being continuous time, continuous in time and discrete in time is another thing. So there are many classifications of signals. This is just one classification based on the values of the signal itself. If the values vary over a continuous range, it is analog, regardless of the time axis. And the same for uh, for the digital, regardless of the time axis. Another classification that uh, you used in your question is if it is continuous time or discrete time. And this is, again, another uh, classification so you'll have to know this distinction between the signals and, and and thank you that's that's a great question and we're going to uh i'm going to give more details about this in the next lecture plus other classifications as well because it's, it's not only analog versus digital or continuous time versus discrete time there are other uh, classifications as well uh thank you for uh, for paying attention uh, to this uh, now uh Modulation. We mentioned modulation, or or uh, or we mentioned that we need a transmitter and then we need a receiver at the destination side. But but why do we really need this? First, let's define something. The input signal that we said. Uh, so we had a transmitter, right? We have an input signal, and we have a transmitted signal. This input signal here at the transmitter, which, as we just said, could be analog or a digital signal, is called a base band signal. Baseband means that these uh, signals have uh, frequency components that are low. For example, and we give this example already, we said that the voice channel, I'm sorry, the voice signals uh, have a range from like 50 to 10 kilohertz, for example. This signal is called a baseband signal. It is baseband because it is its frequency components are low. If, if, we, if we plot this signal over frequency, it would be like limited to low frequencies. This is baseband signal. After the modulation or after the transmission, this signal here is called a pass band or in some case band pass signal. And you'll know the difference in a second. So modulation is, and this is based on uh, Wikipedia's definition, which is a really nice definition. 
Wikipedia defines modulation as the process of varying one or more properties of a high frequency periodic waveform called the carrier with a separate baseband signal called the modulation or modulating signal that typically contains information to be transmitted. Let's break this down. I know that this is a lot. So first, it is the process of varying one of or more properties of a signal. Second, the signal that we're going to change its properties is a high frequency periodic signal and it is called a carrier signal. And the signal we're going to use to change this carrier signal is the baseband signal, which we call the modulation signal. So we need to understand this process. We have a modulator, we have a modulating signal or modulation signal, which is number three in this definition here. We have a carrier signal that we're going to change one of its properties, which is number two here. And we have a modulated signal, which is the carrier signal after change. This carrier signal is really important. It is the signal we use to carry. It's from its name, carrier. It is the signal we use to carry the information in this signal here to transmit it to some other receiver. This example here on the right, is this is here a modulating signal or the input to the transmitter this is simply the input signal and this here is the carrier and as you can see that the frequency of the carrier is much higher than the frequency of the modulating signal so this is the first note the carrier frequency is almost always higher than the uh, modulating or the modulation signal this modulating signal, by the way, is, is the signal with the information. This is the signal you want to transmit. It could be your voice. It could be uh, your email. It could be your text message. This is the modulating signal. It is an information bearing signal. This is the carrier. This carrier is generated in the modulator. You, can, you do not control this in your, in your device or in your phone, for example. This here, what I'm calling amplitude uh, modulating signal, it is the carrier after changing its amplitude. Amplitude modulated signal, it is the carrier after changing amplitude. We said here that we are going to vary one or more of the properties of the signal. For this signal, the properties could include amplitude, right? You can define it can define this signal by its amplitude, you can define it by its frequency, and you can define it by its phase. This is a cosine wave, right? Or a cosine signal. It's simply A sine 2 by F T plus phase. A here is the amplitude, F is the frequency, and phi here is the phase. So we're going to choose one of these three properties of the signal to change. If we change A, that's called amplitude modulation because we're changing the amplitude of the carrier to carry or to transmit the information in the modulating signal. You can see that as, let me change the color of the pen. The, as the uh, input signal changes, the amplitude of the carrier also change you can see this here right and it is minimum when the input signal is minimum and it is maximum when the input signal is maximum so we embedded the our input signal or our modulating signal in the carrier and then we can transmit this signal and same here for for this frequency modulated signal you can notice here that the frequency in this signal change it's it's not constant anymore like the one here in this uh, in this carrier and you can also notice that around this area the frequency is the highest right and this again corresponds to the maximum of the input signal 
and the same here in this area the frequency is the lowest which corresponds to the lowest value of the input signal so this is what modulation does to the carrier this is really important to remember we are modulating the carrier not the signal we are modulating the carrier by modulating we mean we are varying one of the properties of the carrier it could be its amplitude its frequency or its phase and we change these according to some input signal if we change the amplitude it's called amplitude modulation if we change the frequency it's called frequency modulation and if we change the phase it's called phase modulation and these are the three uh, the main three types of analog modulation now the question is why why do we need to do this but but before answering this question, do you have any other questions before I move uh, to the next slide? Sorry, did you say that angle and phase both fall under frequency modulation? No. Uh, so we have two types of modulation in this case. It's amplitude. We have frequency, we have phase. This is the amplitude, as I said, changing the amplitude here. Frequency is changing the frequency here, and phase is changing the phase here. Both these two are called angle modulation. Okay, so we have amplitude modulation, angle modulation, angle modulation uh, could be frequency modulation or phase modulation because this is here the angle of the cosine wave, right? Would phase modulation just be a shift? That's correct. That's a nice question. Let me answer, answer this here. And I was waiting actually for this question. This is why I only listed amplitude and frequency. For phase, what is uh, phase uh, modulation? Let's take a simpler example to be more clear. Let's say this is our input message or the modulating uh, signal. It is ones and zeros. And this here is our carrier in phase modulation as we said we change the phase phi right so if this is our carrier signal and we only have two values for the input signal it is like a or zero in this case which corresponds to one zero zero one zero what we would do in phase modulation is to assign some phase to the ones and some other phase to the zero so let's say that we will use zero phase for zero and pi over two phase for one so what would happen here is let me i'm sorry for my drawing is not perfect What would happen here is as follows. For one, we will add a phase. This is why you will have your signal doing like this, for example. You can see that the phase of the carrier now has been shifted by pi over two. For the zero, we will keep the phase of the carrier. So it would be something like this. Again, zero, it will keep going like this. Again, one, the phase would change to be something like this. And for the zero, it would be something like this. But by the way, this is not 100% accurate. This is, this is not how it will look like because this will be more regular and the same number of cycles uh, for each uh, for each symbol was here. But the idea is in, in phase modulation, 
you will see in, in your signal it was like going like this and then suddenly it will jump with the phase changing here by pi over 2 from 0 to 1. So to answer your question, yes, phase modulation is just shifting the signal based on the input uh, signal. And again, we're going to discuss this in more details in, in later lectures. So it shifts uh, vertically. So fa phase means shift in time, right? Add, adding adding phase like if if this is if this is the signal shifting it by uh, minus pi over two for example would would, would be something like this. So yes, in 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 this direction. Yes, it it jumps because you shifted the uh, the the phase. Got it. So you shifted the phase. So if 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 you if if this is the simple duration here, you'll see that the simple after modulation it would be like this. So it just jumped. Uh, this is not pi over two. This is I'm sorry. This is uh, oh the eraser is not working. This is just pi. Good, thank you. Uh, so now for the question why, why do we need uh, modulation? There are actually many reasons. The first one is to reduce the antenna height. From the electromagnetic waves, we knew that to transmit an electromagnetic wave, the transmit antenna size should be a fraction of the wavelength of the transmitted signal. This is, of course, for an efficient uh, transmission. For example, in, in many antennas, this formula is used. The antenna length L, <coughs> or the antenna height, is just one-fourth of the wavelength, which is not practical for most baseband signals. And this is why. Here, for example, for a speech signal from 100 to uh, 3K Hertz. The corresponding wavelength is 100 to 3,000 kilometer. And, and th does anyone know how to calculate the wavelength uh, from uh, the frequency? How do we calculate lambda from the frequency? 1 over F. Any answers? You might have confused this with something else. One over F is the period of the signal. V over F, close. What's V? Speed of light, times speed of light. So it is C divided by F. C here is the speed of light, and F is the frequency. So to calculate lambda in this case, let's say for, for this 100 hertz is 3 times 10 to the power 8 divided by 100. That's 3,000 kilometers. So can you imagine for this lambda, we want to design an antenna with the height of lambda over 4, which is 750 kilometer. Can you see how impractical this is? You need an antenna of height 750 kilometer. That's impossible. But what if we change the frequency or transmit the same signal using a 100 megahertz carrier? So in this case, Let's let me go up for a second here. So the frequency of this input signal will remain the same, but we will now use a carrier frequency with a much higher frequency. In this example, let's say the carrier frequency is 100 megahertz. What would be the corresponding antenna height? 
let's see. So lambda in this case, again, c over f, it is 3 times 10 to the power 8 divided by 100 mega 10 to the power 6. That would be 3 meters, which would mean the antenna height would be 75 centimeters. Which one is more practical? To have an antenna height of 75 centimeter or 750 kilometer. It is, of course, the 75 centimeter case. And this is the first reason why we do modulation. We want to reduce the antenna size to a practical size. By carrying the signal over a high frequency carrier, we can do this. The second reason, and also important reason, is multiplexing. By multiplexing, I mean we can simultaneously transmit multiple signals without interfering with each other by carrying each baseband signal over a different carrier frequency. And the key word here is without interference. Interference here happens when two users or two transmitters use the same frequency at the same time. When you use the same frequency at the same time with other transmitter, you will interfere with each other and you will not be able to receive the signal correctly. So they do two things in, in, in communication systems. They either restrict the time you can transmit to separate these two transmitters in time, or the, you can separate these two transmitters uh, transmissions in frequency. Each transmitter use a different frequency. And this is what multiplexing is. Some multiplexing, like it's called TDM, time division multiplexing, and FDM, frequency division multiplexing. Modulation allows us to do this frequency division multiplexing. Let's say we have these three signals, voice signals here, from 300 to uh, 3.4 kilo, kilohertz. You cannot really transmit those at the same time because they will interfere with each other. So if we modulate each signal with a different frequency, and these frequencies are chosen sufficiently apart from each other to avoid overlap, this will shift the frequency of each signal to avoid interference. So we can hear this is, here is the channel. So we can transmit these three signals simultaneously over the channel at the same time. And you can see here, these will not interfere with each other because we have correctly chosen our carrier frequencies to, uh, to achieve uh, this separation between the signal. And this is the second reason why, uh, why we use modulation, so that we can do multiplexing or we can simultaneously transmit multiple signals at the same time without interfering with each other. So uh, a question says, amplitude modulation for practically practicality of lambda and phase modulation for uh, multiplexing. No, actually, um, it is modulation. Because as you can see here, let me go back here. That common thing between amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and phase modulation is that the frequency is higher than the input signal, right? You can see that the frequency in the amplitude modulated signal is the frequency of the carrier, not the signal. And the same in the frequency modulated signal, and the same in the phase modulated signal. So it is modulation, not just amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, or phase modulation. The three types of modulation carry the signal or the input signal over the carrier which has high frequency and by increasing this frequency the output of the modulator would look like this or this or this based on the frequency you choose for uh, your carrier so it is modulation this is important it is modulation Good, thank you. Is there a limit on how high of a frequency we can uh, transmit in general? Uh, I would say, of course, there is a limit, but it the, 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 good, the good thing is when 
uh, let me uh, add some space here. So as I, I as we said, the wavelength here is C over F, right? This is constant, and it is over F. When you increase F, you decrease lambda, and you eventually decrease the size of the antenna. And this is actually what the current technologies are, are trying to achieve. They are trying to use higher frequencies because higher frequencies uh, come with huge benefits. First, it reduces the antenna size so that you can't like like for example you can uh, in, in in the example i've just given here 100 megahertz corresponded to 75 centimeter right while this 75 centimeter is practical for some applications but it is not practical for a cell phone for example right you cannot have a 75 centimeter on, on your cell phone this is why your cell phone operates in much higher frequencies than 100 megahertz this would decrease the size of the antenna to let's say one centimeter or 0.1 centimeter or even less so that you can pack more antennas on, on your device. So this is the benefit of a frequency. The higher you go, you can, will make, will, will make you able to reduce the antenna size. And another reason is that the higher you go, that you more spectrum you will get so that you can transmit more signals. This, of course, comes at some expenses, like there are some challenges in higher frequencies as well. But the main point is engineers are trying to explore higher frequencies now 